Thank you for joining this week's Washington Talk. I'm Ji Ha Ham. North Korea has passed a new law authorizing the military to use its nuclear weapons automatically if its leadership comes under attack. While North Korea has adopted the new nuclear doctrine, the U.S. and South Korea held a meeting this week to find ways to strengthen deterrence against North Korea. Meanwhile, world leaders will gather in New York next week to debate global issues. Today, we'll discuss these and more. challenges and the broader set of threats posed by the DPRK uh, to the Indo-Pacific, specifically to our treaty allies, Japan and the ROK, uh, will be a key topic of the discussion that you read. In the studio with me is Victor Cha, Korea Chair and Senior Vice President for Asia at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Professor of Government and International Affairs at Georgetown University. Dr. Cha served as Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. Dr. Cha was also the Deputy Head of Delegation for the United States at the Six Party Talks. He is currently a contributor for MSNBC and NBC News. Mark Tokola is also with me today. Mr. Tokola is Vice President of the Korea Economic Institute of America. Mr. Tokola had served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassies in Seoul, Ulaanbaatar, and Reykjavik. He retired as U.S. Senior Foreign Service Officer with the rank of Minister Counselor in 2014. Welcome to the show. Good to have you both today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. North Korea has officially passed a new law allowing the country to use preemptive nuclear strikes. Kim Jong-un also stressed North Korea's status as nuclear weapons state has become irreversible. Dr. Cha, uh, the new law states that Kim Jong-un shall have all decisive powers concerning nuclear weapons. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the law requires the military to execute nuclear strikes if necessary. I mean. Uh, can we say these two are uh, contradictory to each other? I mean, do you see any contradictions here? Um, I don't see contradictions per se. Um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, all decisions with regard to North Korea's nuclear weapons forces um, is going to be the decision of the leadership. I think that's, that's pretty clear. Um, what's interesting about this statement is that this notion of automation, right, the idea that a decision doesn't have to be made by the leader of North Korea pushing a button, but that this decision could be made automatically or at lower levels of, of, the, uh, of the chain of command is in part a message to the world that North Korea will ensure some sort of nuclear retaliation if there is a preemptive attack, is there, if there is a decapitation strike of some sort. So it's, this is something that we see nuclear powers do. They think about the chain of command in terms of automation as part of their ability to say to others, if you strike us, you will be retaliated against no matter what. So I think that's what they were aiming for in this. And that's one big piece of what came out of this message is this notion of automatic retaliation. The other, as your question suggested, are the conditions under which North Korea would carry out a preemptive first strike. Um, which is not something that we've heard from North Korea in the past. They used, to own, they, they used to say, we have these nuclear weapons largely for defensive purposes as an existential deterrent, um, but they had no, uh, they never delineated any conditions under which they would use them for the purposes of attacking first. They now have done that. Mr. Tokola, I mean, under the new law, North Korea must use its nuclear weapons uh, if its leadership is under attack. Uh, or Kim Jong-un gets killed. So is uh, Kim simply sending a warning message to the world, do not kill me? 
I think it's more than that. The previous North Korean nuclear doctrine, as, as Victor said, was to deter nuclear attack and to repel uh, an attack that happened in North Korea. They've gone beyond that now. This new law lays out four conditions under which they'd use nuclear weapons, not just attack on leadership, but attack on strategic objects um, to try to limit a conventional war if that should happen. And then they finish with any catastrophic crisis involving the security of the state or safety of the people. And so if you take those four together, uh, they could have launch a nuclear we weapon for almost any reason they choose to. And not just that they're attacked, they talk about preemption. So if they feel they're being threatened, they have the right to use nuclear weapons. That's a very uh, destabilizing doctrine. Uh, Dr. Cha, I mean, Kim Jong-un made clear that his country will not negotiate. Then um, how can we even move forward uh, toward denuclearization uh, when the other party is publicly saying that it is not willing to give up its nuclear weapons? So I know that statement is surprising to most. And as a former negotiator, you would expect that it's quite depressing to hear something like that. But when you think about it, it's not that unusual. In fact, it logically follows from what I think North Korean intentions are. You know, I think their intentions have been to get themselves accepted, at least de facto, as a nuclear weapon state, as one of the new nuclear, you know, one of the new nuclear weapon states. And, and so this idea that they would never give up their weapons is again an effort at trying to cement that status. We may not accept it, we, will, we won't accept it, we will never recognize it, but the fact that they've made that statement will lead some people to say, well, you know, this is, they're beyond the point of return right now and we can't get them to give up their weapons. Now, ha still, having said that they're unwilling to give up their weapons does not rule out the possibility of negotiations. I think North Korea is actually interested in negotiations, but they're not interested in denuclearization negotiations. They're interested in arms control talks. And they said that during the six party talks, that they're interested in arms control talks like we used to do with the Soviet Union. So they want to be a nuclear weapon state, treated as a nuclear weapon state that will engage with the United States, another nuclear power, in arms control talks where they can get things, because they clearly need things from the world, including political recognition, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, medical assistance. They want all these things, but they want all these things as a nuclear weapon state. So for them to say, we're not giving up our weapons, um, no one should ever expect us to give up their weapons, I think doesn't rule out the possibility of negotiations. I don't think they're saying, we're never negotiating. They're not saying that. They're just saying, we're not giving up, uh, we're not giving up our weapons. Right. Um, if, if I can add to that point, sure. um, North Korea says all kinds of things. Uh, they said in the past they would not develop nuclear weapons. They've said they would denuclearize. They've said the armistice is no longer binding, but then they act like it is. They blame South Korea for armistice violations. So consistency is not a North Korean strong point. So I'm not sure we should take this new law as being the definitive statement either for all time. If North, if North Korea decides that denuclearization is in its interest, and that should be our goal to make that happen, then this law won't get in their way of their denuclearizing. Okay, uh, Mr. Tukola, I mean, the U.S. and South Korea resumed a high-level deterrence talk um, this week. I mean, it's been more than four years, I mean, since the last meeting. And we know uh, North Korea uh, made progress on its weapons program uh, in the last four years. I mean, so things have changed. Uh, should the U.S. and South Korea be more uh, specific when they talk about a uh, deterrence uh, issue? I mean, instead of stressing the importance of it? I think the high-level... Um the church dialogue is a good important step. It probably has been too long since they've met. And given, as, as Victor says, the North Koreans are working through their checklist of all the things they said they would do on weapons development and doctrine, it's, it's logical that the deterrence group should meet again. But I'm not sure it's enough. Um, I think if North Korea does a seventh nuclear test, after that, we probably need to think about a further step, which could be establishment of a nuclear planning group, an NPG, which should go beyond uh, the, the deterrence dialogue. NATO has an NPG, they have for decades. And that's a place where non-nuclear states are involved in conversations about nuclear weapons use if it should be necessary. So to have an NPG involving South Korea, United States, and Japan would strike me as a worthwhile step if North Korea tests again. Mm. Uh, Dr. Chan, I mean, the extended deterrence um, is the only measure that South Korea must, I mean, can depend on against North Korea's nuclear attack. Um, but if, if you think of a reality, I mean, would the U.S protect South Korea even while uh, they need to take a huge risk of losing a city of the U.S.? Yeah. So, you know, this is the question that 
I think we both often get when we go to conferences and things in Korea. And, you know, so my, my simple answer to the question is yes, right? I think the United States will defend South Korea, even if North Korea can hold U.S. cities at risk, right? Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. The first is um, we cannot forget that uh, there, there is no conflict on the Korean Peninsula that I can imagine that will not directly involve U.S. lives and U.S. interests. I mean, we have 27,500 troops there. We have tens of thousands of American uh, civilians in, in Korea. The Korean Peninsula is small enough that if there were ever a conflict, it's inevitable that the United States would be involved. So the notion that the United States would sort of antiseptically be sitting back and not feeling the brunt of any sort of North Korean action, I think is just not, is, 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 uh, is just not true. Um, I mean, the other thing I think it, it's important, and um, uh, my colleague at CSIS, Joseph Nye, calls this physical presence on the Korean Peninsula, he calls it the community of fate, right? Our, com our communities are tied together. Our fates are tied together. And that's, I think that's inescapable, right? Um, um, the second reason I think it's important is because U.S. commitment to Korea is not just about Korea. It's about the U.S. commitment to Asia. The United States is an Asia-Pacific power. We are the preeminent power in Asia. Um, and if the United States were not there to defend Korea, then we would essentially be saying we're no longer uh, committed to all of Asia. Right? And, and that is entirely not in U.S. interest. So it's, it's, I know that there's a lot of doubt and questions in, in Korea about this, but um, but in, in my mind, the United States commitment is ironclad, uh, just, as it just as it was during the Cold War, just as it was to European allies uh, in NATO during the Cold War. Mr. Tokola, I mean, in a recent poll, more than 70% of uh, people in South Korea supported the development of their own nuclear weapons. Uh, some of the uh, Korean viewers of Washington Talk uh, also have made similar suggestions. I mean, should we take this idea or these voices seriously? Well, in a democracy, you should take public sentiment seriously. And I'm always prepared to listen to colleagues who have ideas they'd like to put forward. But I don't think that polling is the result of a well-informed extended debate about what this would actually mean. I think if the South Korean public was exposed to a debate, and they probably should be, about what it would actually mean to leave the non-proliferation treaty, the economic effects on South Korea, uh, the effects on South Korea's standing in the world, the effects on the U.S.-Korea alliance, um, I think the polling could come out differently. So as the issue becomes more important, uh, there is a need for a more informed debate of all the ramifications of it. Um, Dr. Cha, I mean, some say this idea of just having um, com active conversation about South Korea's nuclear I mean, development uh, may press China to curve North Korea. What do you think? Um, I don't really think so. Um, you know, I don't, I think China is committed right now to not being helpful on the denuclearization issue with North Korea. Uh, we always like to believe that China, if we engage China on North Korea, China would be helpful in terms of getting North Korea to the denuclearization table for negotiations uh, because it was in China's interest. Right? Um, um, and that was a, the premise of the six party talks and having China as the chair of the six party talks. But it's clear from statements by people as high as Wang Yi that China doesn't look at the issue that way. It sees it largely as transactional. They're not going to help the United States on North Korea because the United States uh, relationship with China is very bad now. The United States is you know, supporting Taiwan's defense, all these sorts of things. So it has nothing to do with the question of whether nuclear weapons uh, being in North Korea is or is not in Chinese interest. That is not what is driving Chinese behavior on the issue. It's simply this notion of, well, you're not helping us and you have this competitive relationship, this new competitive strategic framework with us, so we're not going to help you on, on North Korea. So, um, so this notion that somehow North Korea would see South Korean debate on, uh, on nuclearization, potential nuclearization, as motivating them to be more helpful with the United States on, on, on North Korea, I, I, I don't really see that happening. Yeah, I'm not sure China could make North Korea denuclearize even if they wanted to. I mean, Tony Blinken, before he was secretary, made the comment that um, China has great leverage over North Korea, but almost no influence. I think there's something to that. I think China sees North Korea as being a fragile regime. And they're much more worried about regime instability than about the nuclear weapons program. 
World leaders will gather in New York next week for the General Assembly's annual high-level sessions. Uh, the U.S., South Korea, and Japan announced that their leaders will head to New York to attend the General Assembly. And the South Korean government said President Yoon's U.N. speech would be aimed at resolving international issues and establishing a global order based on universal values. Mr. Tokola, I mean, traditionally, South Korea I mean, focused on more of a security issue uh, on the peninsula I mean, in North Korea. Uh, but now uh, it is uh, talking about more broad issues, uh, including a, a global order, which the U.S. government has been uh, promoting um, and tried to shape. Can we uh, take this as a sign that South Korea's role uh, or stance is uh, now changing? Well, South Korea's role is changing because the world is changing. You know, I don't think we can appreciate yet how different the world has become. I mean, COVID, climate change, uh, technology, and now the Ukraine war have made the world very different from what was a few years ago. Uh, two concrete examples of that are that the difference between security and economic issues has dissolved. So we're talking about uh, digital network security, we're talking about supply chain resilience. Those are not traditional economic or security issues. There's something in between. So that's a different way of seeing the world. The other big difference is I think the Pacific and Atlantic theaters have also become one theater. It was, no, uh, it was very intentional that South Korea, Japan, and Australia were at the NATO summit in Madrid in June 2022. And New Zealand. And New Zealand. I forget, <laughs> I forget New Zealand. So, and also the NATO strategic concept from 2022 made a very tough statement on China. First time they've talked about China. So we, we shouldn't think about the Pacific and Atlantic theaters anymore. Now it's a 21st century single theater. In that world, Korea can play a very important part. Yeah, I, can I just add to that? So I, I, I entirely agree with what Mark said. I think it's certainly that the, ex, the external environment for Korea has changed. It's changed dramatically, right? But I would couple that also with um, the new South, relatively new South Korean president's views on foreign policy. You know, as we all know, um, this guy was never a politician, right? Uh, was elected president and had no foreign policy experience. And what struck me um, was in uh, the debate that they had during the campaign on foreign policy issues during the campaign. Um, President Yun, then President, Le I mean, President candidate Yun, but President Yun's first statements about foreign policy were about not about this is what I'm going to do with Japan, this is what I'm going to do with China, this is what I'm going to do with NATO, this is what I'm going to do on supply chains. It was about this is my compass on foreign policy. It's freedom, democratic values, open political order, right? And so as someone who was learning about foreign policy, you know, I'm, I was just an outsider watching this, but as someone learning about foreign policy, I was like, that's the way to learn about foreign policy. Figure out what you believe in and then let your foreign policy follow from that. So I think it's a combination, as Mark said, of the external environment really changing, and it really has changed dramatically for Korea. And an individual, a leader who's coming in and saying, I'm hanging my hat with regard to foreign policy on support of the liberal international order, support for human rights, um, uh, open economic and political orders, these sorts of things. So the fact that he's going to New York uh, uh, next week and he's going to be talking about broader issues than just North Korea is exactly where Korea should be. Uh, then um, this is a big I mean, difference, I mean, change um, compared to last year. I mean, the Moon government, the previous Moon government, I mean, seemed to devote its energy to pushing for an end of war declaration, uh, for example, or uh, easing sanctions on North Korea. So what would you say to that? Well, it's, it's the environment changing. I think if President Moon was going to be in office five more years, I know it's impossible, but in theory, he'd be facing the same change in environment. So I, I don't think there's a big difference, actually, in South Korea between the, between the um, leadership. They can operate within a fairly narrow scope of realities. The realities are uh, North Korea, China, you know, the world, the economy. So within that band, I think South Korean leaders will make their decisions. Whether it's progressive or conservative, I don't think they'll come out that differently. Dr. Chan. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I do think also uh, it was a different environment in the sense that you had a the previous South Korean president was, that was trying very hard to salvage what was left of the summit diplomacy that had taken place between the United States and DPRK and South Korea. Um, and the international environment was certainly in turmoil, but not the way it is in turmoil today, where you know, we have an all-out war happening in Europe and lots of concerns about what might happen in the Taiwan Straits. 
Um, so in that sense, I think you know, the, he was dealing with a different deck of cards, if you will, than what President Yun is dealing with. But it is noteworthy that, that, that the current South Korean president has been pretty clear that um, they want to support the liberal international order and they want to become deeply, deeply involved in the sort of democracy-based networks, democracy-functional-based networks that are growing in Asia. Things like the Quad, uh, IPEF, uh, the CHIPS4, you know, a, a variety of these sorts of things. That, um, and, and so that, I think, is um, a sign that Korea not only wants to be obviously involved on the peninsula and globally, uh, but it wants to be deeply uh, networked in the, in the multilateral groupings that are forming in the region. Yeah, and one different card in South Korea's hand is the United States. I mean, President Moon was dealing with a Trump administration that only thought in bilateral terms and largely contentiously, where President uh, Yoon is dealing with a Biden administration that's almost always interested in groups of countries, not bilateral. They're interested in what groupings of countries can deal with what issues. That's very different. Uh, well, my last question today for today, um, South Korea has been um, expressing its concerns over the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. Um, as we expect to see a summit meeting between the United States and South Korea, um, do you uh, think the two leaders uh, can come up with possible solutions? This is a question for both of you. Dr. Chow first. Uh, well, I certainly hope that they'll come up with solutions. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act is a domestic policy act. Um, I don't know how carefully the sort of foreign policy implications of the act were thought about as they put it together and as they try to get it through Congress. You know, the big issue for any White House is getting things like this through, through, uh, through the Congress. I think the South Korean side at all levels has made very clear what their concerns are with, with regard to this. I think the U.S. government has heard what the South Korean concerns are um, and that they will try to find a way to address it. But, you know, folks have to understand this is, and, and Mark knows this very well, this is, you know, there's a domestic side of the House and then there's a foreign policy side. And sometimes they don't talk to each other. And this is one case where because of South Korean complaints and concerns that have been raised, they will have to talk to each other. And hopefully they'll find a solution that will be acceptable to all sides. Yeah, I don't expect a quick solution. Um, I think given the domestic politics, as Victor said, nothing much can happen until after the midterm elections in November. We might have to be patient for a bit. But after that, I think there are three promising signs. Uh, one is that the administration, my administration, is taking this very seriously. So consultations are being carried out to see what can be done. That's good. Uh, second, the act is not all negative. Uh, there, are, there are Korean companies that benefit from it too. So it's a mixed bag. The uh, Hanwha Solutions Company, which works on solar energy, is going to benefit by $200 million in this act. So it's, it's sort of a mixed thing. I mean, the best news is the act probably cannot be implemented as written. It's not workable. I mean, most experts say the targets cannot be met, which means it'll have to be modified at some point, and that'll leave uh, room for free negotiating parts of it. And I think we can help create that point. And my last point would be we should recognize the act has a good objective. The act is designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We all want that. And so we should try to improve the act, uh, not try to walk back from it or wreck it. The U.S. aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan will arrive in Busan, Korea next week to conduct drills with the South Korean Navy, according to media reports. It will mark the first time in five years that a U.S. aircraft carrier makes a port call in Korea. What message will the U.S. send to North Korea? And how will North Korea perceive this message? We'll have to watch closely. Dr. Cha and Mr. Tokola, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Pleasure. And that does it for this week's Washington Talk from Voice of America. Please join us again next week for more analysis.